Okay, let's begin. So hello and welcome to Frontier Views webinar on Turkey's outlook for 2021. Uh, I'm Mark McNamee, the Director for Europe Research. Uh, before we get started, we realize that some of you may be new to Frontier View, so we'll just take a minute to provide you with a very, very quick overview of the firm and how we work with executives at major multinationals. Um, so as you can see here, <clears throat> uh, Frontier View provides the world's best market intelligence and advisory services for global business professionals. We help our clients grow and win in their most important markets by informing and empowering the market monitoring, planning, execution, and other critical decision processes of our clients. With continuous research and insights, custom solutions, and transaction support services, we provide our clients just a small sample uh, of what you can see here with timely, actionable insights to adapt and win in changing emerging markets. If you are not a client and are interested in receiving a 60 day complimentary free trial access to our Frontier View program, please leave a comment in the chat box here or otherwise email us at info at frontierview.com. Also, as part of our offering, uh, something we've gotten very uh, solid client feedback on. We're excited to announce that we have recently launched a new mobile app, uh, Frontier View Mobile, uh, available both on iOS and Android, by the way. It includes all the relevant content you need to monitor your markets, uh, including this webinar recording uh, and the presentation deck. We encourage you to download the app to have access to these sites and more just at your fingertips. Uh, current clients can access the mobile app using the same login information as our browser application. If you are not a client, you can still download the app and start monitoring up to five complementary countries and access other features like daily news and notifications. So that said, having briefly introduced our company, I'd like to take a moment now to introduce our presenter. So Frontiers Views Director for Middle East, Africa and Turkey Research, Zeynep Kosoresolu, will be leading the presentation today. <clears throat> if there are any insights you see today as part of this discussion or any questions we don't get to answer, our client services team uh, will be happy to follow up with you directly and we will also of course make uh, the, this recording as well as the presentation slides you see today available to you which we'll be sending after the webinar this morning so with that i'd like to, uh, to turn things over now to zainab to take us through our agenda thank you mark we have a packed agenda for our audience today we'll start by confirming the global context and the key assumptions we need to make for our outlook on Turkey, including on the country's vaccination progress and political relations. We will then move on to providing our um, baseline macroeconomic assumptions from GDP to the Turkish lira, and of course, the increasingly controversial inflation dynamics. We'll end our webinar by touching on the high level outlook across the country's key sectors. And we'll be, of course, as Mark, you said, looking forward to answering our uh, audience of questions at the end. So let's start by underlining that Turkey is an integral part of the EMEA portfolio, presenting a large size, relatively good growth environment, integrated supply chains, availability of service industries, and good talent. It actually will remain still very difficult to compensate for lower performance in Turkey with other countries in the emerging EMEA region. But Numerous challenges remain in capturing the opportunities here. There are still going to be delayed payments throughout 2021. There are rate hikes that are needed to manage the Turkish lira, which means borrowing costs will remain high. Fluctuations in customer behavior and still this global uncertainty will ensure end demand remains difficult to predict. And lastly, of course, there are numerous factors which continue to cause Turkish lira volatility. So, Starting at that uh, global level, GDP growth, as you can see here, will return to positive across the world in 2021. But all of these countries, these regions, will have weakened underlying macro fundamentals and for the most part will not be recovering to their pre-COVID-19 size this year. Within that context, as you can see the numbers here, Turkey will actually be ahead in the curve of returning to 2019 GDP size. Actually, as you, might, you may have all seen uh, in the latest data and in the news, Turkey is potentially expected to have even avoided a contraction in 2020 and will be growing relatively well in 2021. But here is when we remind ourselves that Turkey was in recession in 2019. It had had one of its worst economic performances in recent history, 
And on top of that, it received a pandemic crisis. So how sustainable growth will be moving forward will actually depend on, of course, economic policy, but also the vaccination progress and the political risks, all of which we should look at before moving on to the economy. And with that, let's start with the, the vaccination progress. Turkey has approved, uh, contracted with, and received deliveries of the Chinese Sinovac vaccine. There are so far talks with Pfizer-BioNTech with no confirmed amount, price, and timeline for deliveries yet. There are also no announced progress in plans to obtain Moderna or AstraZeneca vaccines or others in development, such as those from uh, Johnson & Johnson. But there are some announced plans to produce the Russian Sputnik V. While progress is being made, as you would have also observed in, in Turkey with the Sinovac inoculation, the government is actually evaluating also plans to lift the, the restrictions. We currently have uh, weekday curfews in Turkey, weekend lockdowns, and a hospitality sector that is only serving takeaway. There are some talks of opening schools in mid-February and potentially opening restaurants uh, in March. All of this will depend highly on how quickly Turkey can administer the vaccines. So far, the Ministry of Health has announced a detailed plan for the rollout, as you can see on the slide here, and has been providing daily updates. There's a, there's a very detailed plan that the authorities are working through. But implementing this plan effectively still will require a constant flow of vaccine deliveries from, from Sinovac. And ideally, to be honest, increasing the number of vaccines, uh, the different vaccines in the country. We want to be cautious still of potential supply shortages that can arise throughout the first half of this year. What we have seen some of that in Western Europe, but this is not just a Western Europe issue. We still want to be watching carefully for that risk. And with the delivered vaccines, though, I think certain factors have definitely allowed Turkey to relatively rapidly inoculate the, the population. There is an existing organized, streamlined healthcare system, especially uh, the e-healthcare records. There was a relatively well-managed track and trace system when you compare it to many other emerging markets. And of course, the country did invest in healthcare and ICU capacity throughout 2020. There's still a lot of room for improvement on all of these fronts but they have shown success relative to other emerging markets in the region. But there are still definitely room uh, for progress, especially when you look at the fact that the country needs more vaccines, more variety of vaccines in the country, um, especially those that have been more vetted, that are mRNA vaccines. This will create a more diversified supply option, but also help protect against variants of the virus in the future. There is also a need for more transparency in the payment for the vaccines. Also, we want to watch out for ensuring flexibility in the vaccination program to ensure that any delivered vaccines are actually used as uh, soon as possible. Now, when you look at entirely across the world, currently predicting when any country can reach herd immunity, how effective the vaccines will be, whether and what kind of variants will emerge, all of this is going to be very difficult to, to predict. But there are still some signposts, some numbers we can use to at least watch progress and compare in terms of where the execution is relative to plans. Some signposts that we can look at is firstly, Turkey is likely to lift some restrictions in March, but lifting restrictions before completing phase two and phase three of the vaccination program will still mean that there will be a risk of returning restrictions in the following months. Turkey, also please watch ahead if there are no announcements for new vaccines that can be brought into the country. And moving forward, we still want to watch for the uh, tourism guidelines that Turkey will introduce and also world uh, progress in vaccinations too, which is still quite uncertain. So we would expect that partial normalization begins in Turkey Q2 of this year, with some level of restriction still remaining at least until June 2021. Great, and actually, mm -hmm. sorry, do you want me to jump in here, Zainab, or did you want to uh, mention something else? Okay, so yep. um, what what I thought would be appropriate here uh, would be turning it over to to the audience here. So uh, 
this is an opportunity for you to participate uh, and see uh, basically if you can answer this polling question, see when you expect demand patterns to normalize, particularly in light of internally of what you're seeing, as well as of course taking into account what uh, Zainab's analysis that you just heard. So when do you expect normalization in spending patterns in Turkey to begin? So please select one and then uh, Zainab will be reviewing the answers. So, if we look at the results here, um, basically, uh, the majority believe Q3 2021, so 54% uh, in Q3 2021, and then another 21% in Q4 and beyond. Uh, so, prior to mm -hmm. that, basically, uh, already begun or in Q2, about 25%. So, the 75% basically assuming in the second half of this year or later. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, makes sense in terms of the broad assumptions that we also have in terms of starting to see more of a normalization happening in the second half of this year. And I think it's not surprising that we have more caution amongst our, uh, our listeners. So thank you very much, everyone, for participating. Let's quickly share with you uh, the assumptions that we have on the political environment, and then we can move on to the, um, move on to the uh, economic outlook. On the political side, you can see here that from the domestic perspective, we would expect as COVID-19 is increasingly contained this year, opposition activism does resurface and popular domestic concerns will return about the economy and about uh, fundamental rights and freedom. On the foreign side, there are definitely some risks to watch. As you can see here, numerous global and regional dynamics that are changing and that Turkey will have to respond to that are not even dependent on Turkey at this point. But from uh, our base case assumptions, the forecasts that you will see coming up in, in the slides, they assume no major broad economic sanctions on Turkey. However, these sanctions are definitely downside risks to watch and will be reflected in our Turkish Lira scenarios. So um, on the note of the Lira, obviously I think probably about half of the, the attendees today are on here to hear your views on the Lira. So can you, um, uh, Zainab, can you start, uh, I suppose, sharing the outlook on Turkey's macroeconomic fundamentals? Um, the country, uh, of course, has given sort of a positive impression with these, these high growth rates that you showed. Um, but of course, a lot of companies and the population itself uh, are concerned, especially with the Lira, the Lira volatility, the financial risks uh, involved. So uh, can you please continue on the macro side of things? Of course. Turkey's GDP did grow strongly in Q3. There was a cheap credit push that resulted in strong consumption activity and return of some investments, and exports were still unfortunately negative despite the opening up in Europe. So when we take these and look into 2021, we expect the economy to grow around 4%, and um, export recovery is going to be an important factor. Consumer spending should start to begin to grow around Q2 onwards. Government spending we expect to remain relatively weak. Uh, investments uh, probably to pick up mid-year onwards, but you probably have seen around uh, again in the media. For example, IMF has revised its uh, growth expectations to 6%. We still want to maintain a more cautious uh, growth outlook. There are some risks to the exports and government spending side of the economy. If we see any upside likely to come from a consumer spending and investment uh, parts of the, the economy. And when we look a bit deeper, we'd expect hospitality and tourism sector to recover the last among Turkey's industries, but still this would probably be one of the faster rates relative to other emerging EMEA economies. Construction should begin to recover only towards late 2021 again. And on the healthcare side, even though demand should remain high, Clearly, we have pricing and effects concerns which weigh on the industry. And on the consumer side, durables likely to stabilize because of the rate hikes that we've seen. Uh, and semi-durables, FMCG, probably to pick up in Q2. 
And of course, all of these industries, as, as Mark, you also mentioned, highly depend on the, the stability of the Turkish lira, which uh, lost approximately 25% of its value in 2020. And of course, the main um, reason for that was the loss of confidence in the Turkish uh, lira by Turkish residents, which was a different driver of the previous few years of depreciation, which was mostly foreign investor sell-off. So you can see that the Turkish lira's weakness in performance was in contrast to the global US dollar, which was actually weakening since um, April that you can see there. And in late uh, 2020 and early this year, the strength in the lira is also due to Turkey-related factors. Uh, the central bank governor was replaced. We've seen the benchmark interest rate rise from 10.25 to now 17%. The um, controversial resignation of the finance minister was followed up with a, an appointment that the markets relatively uh, well responded to. And we've seen that uh, strengthening of the Turkish lira. Lately also, because of these developments, Turkish residents have sold some of their dollars and converted them into to Turkish lira, which is uh, a good first sign to see. And we are also observing some influx of foreign interest just in the last few weeks. But we still want to highlight here the latest moves they don't represent a fundamental structural shift in policy making. There's still highly centralized decision making system and numerous uh, political risks ahead. And that's why we are still expecting some depreciation in the Turkish lira. Um, if broad economic sanctions are placed on Turkey, those political risks do materialize if that happens. If we see rate cuts begin prematurely, this can push us to the downside that you see there. But strong positive real interest rates, improvement in the political relations, they can very easily bring us to the upside scenario as well. And currently, I think we would all observe that we are trending towards the upside scenario with some of the latest decisions and an approach to policy making, but we are still maintaining caution with our forecast. And they translate to the euro, as you see here on the slide. But of course, uh, this very much depends on the euro dollar view. And I think, Mark, maybe you can jump in to share quickly our view on the euro dollar dynamic. Sure. So I'll try to make this as brief as possible. Um, but this is one of the most common questions we've been getting uh, really in the last month uh, from clients uh, across EMEA. Uh, in short, the euro is, is frankly uh, excessively strong and should uh, correct itself and moderate its strength uh, from where it is has been for about the last month uh, over the course of the year still relatively strong against global currencies as well as the dollar but a little bit weaker than its current rate um, while the dollar is likely uh, a bit uh, too weak uh, at, at the moment and should probably strengthen minimally or at least stabilize over the next six months or so that said towards the end of the year we should see renewed strengthening of most emerging market currencies against the dollar uh, as uh, confidence in emerging markets starts to recover in this post-COVID environment. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mark. And I think when we look at these exchange rates, it's very important in terms of a pricing and, and planning perspective. And it, of course, because they have severe pass-through effects on, on inflation. After a 12.3% annual average inflation last year, we're actually expecting still <clears throat> sticky high inflation and currently forecasting around 11 to 12 percent, an annual average for this year as well. And this is a different trend. I want to highlight here on this chart, as you can see, in 2020, we had around 12 percent inflation with 24 percent annual average depreciation in the Turkish lira. We're forecasting much less depreciation this year, around 10 to 14 percent, but still keeping the inflation rates relatively high. And that's because there are still high food prices, a domestic demand push that is coming middle of this year. And lastly, of course, businesses need to recover their financials from, from previous years. Mm -hmm. So they have this, this uh, the 12 percent, right, that you're, you're, you're citing here is itself one of the highest inflation rates in the world because 2020 most emerging markets actually saw prices slow price growth slowing because of the drop in demand um however i i understand that uh living costs in a lot of emerging markets and in russia included uh, a market of my primary focus but also in turkey are actually higher than headline inflation so can you give a little bit more commentary on that please yes this is a very important point and as you highlighted 12 percent itself 
is a high number relative to the world, but it's also within Turkey, it comes after double digit inflation since 2017 and near 10% inflation before that. But even this year with that number, there we need to recognize that cumulatively speaking, and just even last year, living costs have been rising. And um, there are some numbers we can look at that show uh, more challenges on the consumer. Food inflation is around 21% in December, but when you look at some specific items, the prices range from zero to 100% increases in uh, food prices on an item by item basis. Some of the uh, utility side rental prices are to be capped at 12.3% legally. If that is implemented on the ground, we'll see. Electricity tariffs are set at 12% uh, for the first quarter of this year relative to uh, the first quarter of last year. So these, the authorities are trying to cap, but uh, we have seen that the government recognizes a much higher cost of living taking place. So around 22% increase we've seen in the minimum wage. Some other government reevaluation uh, numbers, that are, especially when you look at the bridge tolls in Istanbul, for example, raised by 26%. When we look at the uh, producer side, the input cost side, we have 25% growth in uh, producer prices, input prices uh, in December. And when you look actually at the um, prices on the imported producer side, 40%, these are very high numbers that will reflect into inflation in Q1. And when we look at Q1, again, the Turkish lira is 25% weaker in January of this year versus January of last year, even though we've seen some appreciation lately. We also have oil prices that are 17% higher January versus December, but they're basically flat, slightly lower than January of last year. So there's actually quite a bit of um, dynamics taking place that are putting some pressure on um, the living costs for, for Turkish consumers. And this, of course, is uh, quite important in terms of pricing. And when we look into the future, there are further risks ahead with restaurants opening up and Ramadan coming up that will actually create some further inflationary pressures. And this is important from a pricing perspective. So I actually would like to ask the audience here um, in terms of, of the price increases that they're trying to implement moving forward into the year, how um, that, that expectation is moving forward. So if we can get your participation again to see a benchmark of uh, price increases you're planning to implement, that would be great and we'll give you 30 seconds to answer as well. Okay, thank you everyone. I think we can close the poll. We can and... close the... So, uh, in terms of the results, um, so it looks like uh, either no increase, that's about 14%, or zero to 5% increases 27%. So, that's pretty substantial. It's about 41%, expecting no uh, price increases or just small ones, zero to 5%. Um, 11 to 15% is 20%. Uh, expecting these increases and then above 15% is another 25. So the majority are either, they're kind of bifurcated here, right? So about 40 some percent mm -hmm. aren't doing significant increases at all. And then another 45% are doing 11% or higher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it seems there's probably quite a lot of divergence here based on the product that uh, these companies are bringing into the market, we are seeing that the ability to justify price increases really varies from sector to sector and, um, and of course, from uh, product to product. So I think if we go back to the presentation uh, slides that, uh, that we have, at least uh, on the uh, industry side for businesses that are selling to other businesses in Turkey, we still want to watch that FX uh, pressure on these industries and ability to reflect the cost increases onto selling prices. We've seen in, in the poll as well that the ability to reflect that really varies and it's going to be a determining 
factor in maintaining margins, of course. Great. So thanks for that uh, de detailed overview. Uh, so I think it's uh, important now to dig a little bit deeper, Zainab. So if we can uh, move to the sectoral updates, uh, starting with uh, the government sector now. Of course. We'll go through a relatively quick overview across the, the sectors. The, uh, of course, how, what the, how the government is doing impacts all businesses on the line. The Turkish government increased expenditures by around 20% in nominal terms uh, last year, focusing the spending a little bit on employee compensation, but mostly on current transfers, which are uh, mostly cash support to the population. Debt servicing, as you can see here, interest payments are also taking critical resources away from productive spending. There were some capital expenditures focusing on key high-profile projects, but mostly COVID-19 capacity building. And in the near future, the government is planning to return some activity on the project side. Clearly, after two years of negative uh, investment, there will be some effort to revitalize that this year. Uh, this is then planned to normalize beyond 2022. So there's a small window of potential opportunity to capture uh, government investment plans. But overall, you can see operational expenditures, procurements, they remain lower than even our inflation forecast, so quite limited. There's going, there's going to be some focus on public sector efficiencies, especially digitalization, and expanding the e-government system for sure. And on the CapEx side, clearly, when you look at in general, the ministerial uh, kind of increases, uh, transportation and infrastructure taking the, the lion's share of that additional resources that are to be allocated uh, this year. And outside of that additional focus on infrastructure, the budget shares remain relatively similar to historical allocation of resources. Healthcare did receive higher spending last year, but this is clearly expected to normalize um, this year. And when we look at the investment program, which has recently been released, again, we see that majority of that focus is going to transportation and communications, followed by education and energy, the top three sectors that receive government resources, followed then by mining, health, and uh, agriculture. And from that, let's take a very brief look at the healthcare side. And there we have a few key trends we want to highlight. The first is that the 2021 budget envisioned a higher Ministry of Health allocation than was initially anticipated. So uh, from 69 billion liras originally planned for this year, the healthcare budget was increased to 78 billion Turkish liras. But just to uh, highlight to our audience here, the 2020 figure is the budgeted pre-COVID, not the actual health spending that took place. The second key trend we want to highlight is financing constraints. There was, of course, a drop in revenues of the social security institution, which was very important in 2020, but this was partly balanced by the fact that electives and many procedures were not undertaken due to COVID. So a lot of the reimbursements and claims also dropped. But as the healthcare se sector gradually normalizes this year, but revenues don't necessarily increase, the deficit of the uh, social security institution, PGK, will actually increase and the need for budget transfers to the institution will also increase. A third trend, very important, is the continued gap between the government's fixed exchange rates for uh, pharmaceutical procurement versus the market rate of the lira. So this month, February coming up, is an important month for that reevaluation. But uh, fourth very important trend is the decision to abandon public-private partnerships as a model for city hospitals. The, while these projects did create opportunities uh, for many firms previously. There's, of course, payment delays that have now reached over two years in many cases in university hospitals, but now indebtedness of city hospitals as well, which um, even when we saw the recent decision to pay these arrears with significant discounts, all of this is putting pressure on medical devices firms as well. And moving forward, we do see some of the healthcare plans of the government continuing to prioritize focusing uh, drug cost reductions and also looking for ways to innovate uh, uh, on the oncology chronic and rare diseases side but uh, there are additional priorities emphasis on medical tourism elderly health and telehealth as well and the last trend on the healthcare side is of course ongoing localization pressures which i think don't need that much um, uh, kind of surprise on on the government side 
Now, very quickly, moving on to the construction sector, moving away from the public more towards that um, B2B side, activity in the construction sector entered a positive territory in Q3, but this was due to, as we mentioned before, an artificially cheap credit push, which was unsustainable. So when we consider the last few quarters of uh, weak performance that you see on the slide, plus the uh, decline in revenues that we had been observing since 2018, the pickup in late last year is important, and we do see that confidence and revenues are starting to show a bit of an uptick, but uh, we think that this is going to be normalizing, stabilizing early this year, and unlikely to really substantially accelerate before the second half of um, the year. And there were numerous challenges that the, the sector faced last year, but we, we still think there will be some opportunities potentially in the construction of logistics, storage, uh, hospitals, medical clinics, labs, but also still detached residential housing and even landscaping areas. So uh, when we think about there will be some more additional automation and hygiene uh, related uh, trends to bring into construction in the high value projects, uh, there's still some opportunities to be, to be looked at. And very important is, of course, the manufacturing sector for Turkey's economy. There is a strong uptick that, again, we observed in Q3 after that severe contraction you saw in uh, the Q2 of last year. And um, what uh, we think for 2021 is this number is going to be moderating uh, early 2021, especially when you look at the drop in both external and domestic demand. But April onwards, that's when we again start to see some increased production, especially in preparation for some anticipated demand hikes in the second half of the year. And when we look at it on a sectoral basis, you see that there was a bit of an uptick seen in late 2020 again on durable goods, motor vehicles, um, which was definitely needed because these industries faced a very difficult 2019. Um, again, this is likely to not continue at that exponential growth rate, but actually stabilize this year. And then when we look at food and non-durable manufacturing, that there we see a moderately stable performance likely to continue throughout this year. But there's, of course, a lot of other additional industries we can talk about. So our clients on the line, please reach out to your client services manager and we'd be happy to follow up on um, more specific industries that uh, you are focused on on the, on the manufacturing side. And there are a few service industries, of course, overall, in, when we look at the service industries outside of the hospitality, because of course that area is, is going to be under quite a bit of struggle this year. If we look at some of the other areas, for example, on the financial side, we are uh, seeing that in contrast to the rest of the world, actually the finance industry in Turkey had seen relatively strong growth again in Q3 because of that uh, encouraged lending activity, that cheap credit push. But that firstly has now reversed. We are in a high rate hike environment. Um, the Turkish layer depreciation also puts pressure on the bank balance sheets as many uh, borrow at foreign markets that lend to the Turkish market in local currency. So very similar pressures on, on the banking sector there as well. And unfortunately, this higher interest rate environment could dampen that credit demand in at least the near future. Plus, lately we've seen an improvement, but we still want to be careful on that risk premium on Turkey, which could still remain uh, as an important uh, cost for uh, banks borrowing um, borrowing side and on the real estate side this was again a year of volatility uh, in turkey for for the sector 2020 definitely characterized by a very strong rise in residential activity in q3 in the summer months and then an important drop on the commercial side so very different stories uh, on across the board there and you can see in the chart uh, on the left that the strong 200% increase in sales that happened was driven by a housing credit growth of around 60%. But then this quickly turned negative. We're currently on the sales side minus 40 in that category because of that end to cheap credit. And we're just uh, aiming to see some of that moderation in uh, 2021. On the ICT side, of course, information communications technology, uh, of course, continued uh, growth that we have uh, observed especially also with the additional um, challenges brought by, by the pandemic. 
that there's going to be some ongoing need for efficiencies in uh, businesses, digitalization, streamlining of processes, but still the government side as well, distant learning and distant working needs still uh, a priority for government as well to spend some money on. So the, the key factor here is, yes, there will be a rising demand for these services, but we also want to watch on the public side, the government's efforts to see localization in the industry and potential preferential treatment uh, of uh, some of the few larger Turkish firms as well. And with that, we can turn to our latest last service sector, which is the tourism sector. Um, when we look there, Turkey actually experienced one of the best pickups in Q3 relative to the emerging uh, EMEA, actually relative to EMEA. But even with that, you can see the numbers registered around 60 to 70 percent lower tourist arrivals during those months. And in 2020, we definitely expect a recovery, uh, an improvement in tourist arrivals, but these total arrivals will probably still be around 30% lower than those of 2019. So a reminder, 2019 was a record year for Turkey. We had a very strong increase in arrivals, mainly also supported by a cheaper lira at that time. And relative to that, plus with the ongoing restrictions around travel and, and concerns around travel, there will still be a tourist arrival level that is lower than 2019, but clearly um, a pickup is coming uh, at, at least at a gradual level for this summer. Mm -hmm. Great, Zainab. Thanks for that. Um, so um, as a reminder to the listeners here, uh, clients can reach out to their client services managers uh, and request tailored briefings for their business where we can provide more detailed updates, for example, on the public sector, on the various sectors uh, Zainab just went through, as well as uh, the consumer outlook. So I'm sure the audience would like to hear uh, your thoughts on the consumer outlook here, Zainab. Mm -hmm. Yes, let's take a, a quick look at that. All of these are, developments are going to be impacting the consumers very directly amidst this kind of volatile, complex economic uh, picture. Uh, actually, when we look at the data sets, confidence remains relatively weak. Uh, not just on the data sets, but I think on uh, what you observe uh, on uh, on the ground as well, there's, there's just still some caution in terms of trusting any stability of the lira, trusting any change in um, economic policy, trusting uh, how quickly we can emerge out of this, this pandemic. But uh, when you look at both the old and the revised data sets, clearly we are nowhere near recovering to confidence levels that traditionally characterize the Turkish consumer before the 2018 lira crash. And on top of the, the confidence trends, uh, basically we know that consumers in Turkey are, and their behavior are driven by two main factors. One, confidence very much related to the Turkish lira and two, credit, where um, credit availability and, and access are very important in driving spending. And uh, currently, as you can see from the chart here, consumers are quite now limited in their ability to use credit cards to support purchases because of the indebtedness and the rising uh, interest rates. And uh, we are seeing that, again, after last year, strong increases in vehicle credit is starting to, to normalize. But uh, there's also a steep rise in uh, need-based credit in the middle of 2019, which is basically credit used in moments when households are generally in need of cash and additional income support. So it's just a, an operating um, credit for the household, which is, of course, as you can see, unfortunately been showing a, a worrying increase. Finally, thankfully, this has also turned negative, or let's say not negative, still growing at, at strong rates, but starting to, to normalize. And um, when we combine these factors together, we know that uh, it's putting pressure on the Turkish consumer, but uh, the, the consumer in Turkey has always shown a, a dynamic uh, kind of consumer behavior, willingness to um, kind of expand uh, consumption and, and try new products. However, basically how we're seeing these two factors combined is some pickup in retail sales, yes, but extreme increase in price sensitivity. And I think that might be uh, also reflected in some of the polling that we saw a, a few minutes ago around some companies feeling hesitant with the price uh, increases. And you can see definitely 
with some pent-up demand, the retail sales had actually started to improve in late uh, 2020. They're likely to definitely stabilize, slow down in Q1 of this year. Um, but again, we're expecting a pickup more sustainably from summer onwards. And here, again, the major trend is around price uh, sensitivity. On a category basis, food demand is starting to stabilize, although will likely increase under, of course, these, these lockdowns, but overall it's starting to stabilize. Textiles do remain in negative um, category, or let's say territory. House products, tech products are showing some relatively higher demand, of course, alongside hygiene uh, products and self-care still with that uh, trend. And um, of course, consumers are, are changing their habit in general. Product preferences are shifting under the pandemic. Uh, you're seeing that opportunity for impulse buying has definitely been reduced uh, because of either the lockdowns or shorter time that people are taking to shop in stores. The ability of consumers to experience test products before purchasing has become uh, limited and will remain limited as long as COVID-19 related regulations continue to impact shopping behavior throughout this year. Consumers are also evaluating and rationalizing purchases more, but uh, very importantly, they're also uh, using e-commerce, of course, um, much, much more often. And so when we look at the fact that uh, e-commerce, which was already growing, at around 20% historically, it started to grow significantly in 2019 under the recession and even more significantly under the pandemic. We expect that strong growth to continue. Of course, it cannot continue doubling up forever. So you will see some year-on-year -year numbers slowing down, but this is still going to be a strong growth channel for uh, a lot of the companies that are planning to sell to uh, consumers. Okay. Uh, thank you for that outlook on, on Turkey. So before we uh, share uh, the actions that uh, Zainab and the team have collected from uh, the executives they're working with, uh, we'd like to, again, ask uh, listeners their main area of investment focus for the next six to nine months here. So if we can bring up that next polling question. Um, so the main focus of your Turkey business in the next six to nine months. Okay, we can probably close this out now. Great, thanks. So uh, far and away, the most common response, 58% uh, responded enhancing digital sales and customer engagement. And then the next closest response to just 22% uh, being new product introductions. Um, so Zainab, you want to uh, comment mm -hmm. on those results? Of course, I think, I guess it, this is not a surprise to anyone on the line to, to see these results. We are seeing the focus on digital strategies across the world, across all sectors, whether they range from simply engagement with decision makers and, and customers or actually using and growing e-commerce as a channel for sales. Of course, the ability to do that really varies across sectors, but there's across the board increased investment going into that channel, either as a means of marketing or communication with uh, decision makers or simply sales and the new product introductions I think gives us a sign that there are efforts to adapt to changing needs of the customers whether they are government businesses or, or consumers there's clearly changing preferences and needs but also ways that businesses are looking for to justify uh, price premiums as well so if we go back to our presentation slides these are um, actually similar to what we have been collecting from our um, from our client base as well. And you can see here, more specifically for Turkey, we see that the uh, companies are focusing on uh, using scenarios. First of all, still for FX, for vaccination and reopening timelines. Um, and uh, basically what we're... Um, also seeing is businesses looking to support their customers in demand planning because it is still quite difficult to predict how that demand is going to 
follow. We're also seeing segmentation of customers by financial resilience and pace of end demand uh, recovery. And that, of course, is related to what we've seen adapting offering to changing needs and, and online engagement. And definitely that route to market overall evaluation. Very much a, a key strength of Turkey executives uh, anyways, in terms of building and strengthening the resilience of their business, but there remains that focus on having a diversified customer base, maintaining a very cautious approach to receivables at this point, and definitely messing in those local capabilities and digital transformation. Mm -hmm. so overall, a difficult environment that we see in Turkey, but a lot of action I think uh, we are going to be seeing from Turkey executives this year. Okay, interesting. Yeah, uh, I mean, I can I can comment saying that across Europe and in Russia CIS markets, a lot of these trends are actually relatively similar. So uh, another point may simply be uh, that it, it's it's worth integrating with other uh, regions to discuss a lot of the tactics that they may be using. So internally within the organization, what type of trends are you seeing in terms of internal digital transformation, um, diversifying the customer bases? How are how are companies going about, for example, supporting uh, B2B customers with demand planning, the natures of, of those engagements, how often they're interacting with them. Uh, a lot of these trends are quite similar. I, I just looking at this here, Zainab, that, that I'm hearing, for example, in mm -hmm. Russia consistently throughout CIS. Uh, mm -hmm. So it might be, it, it, it's, I think that's an interesting point maybe is for internally more integration amongst uh, geographic teams. Uh, so just to learn insights, mm -hmm. there's no reason to be siloed in such an environment like this where it's so difficult to execute, of course, amid, amid the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, uh, thank you for uh, the uh, the presentation there, uh, Zainab. We do have a couple of questions that have come in, so um, we have some time for that. So please, uh, as a reminder, please uh, type your questions into the chat uh, in the bottom right uh, of the webinar um, if you have any questions. But uh, Zainab, uh, the first question here is um, if you can speak more about the decision to abandon PPP, PPPs uh in healthcare so public private partnerships in healthcare of course and again as a reminder for our clients we can talk a lot more in depth specifically one on one with you on all of these topics but at a high level what the main trend that we have been observing in the healthcare sector on the um hospital side is of course unfortunately uh, rising pressures on um the costliness of uh, either uh, the operations of states university hospitals but also the kind of uh, the, the difference between the actual operations and earnings of city hospitals versus initially projected by the government so what we have started to see are announcements uh, from the authorities that they will no longer be using for new projects for new city hospitals that have not yet been um, contracted out that it basically they have found that it's likely to be more costly for the government to use this method and they're looking for ways to further organize this expenditure uh, through uh, the MOH and so basically we might start to see that this starts to take more of the resources from the government side and having to, the need to reallocate a, a bit of that onto the these projects and so this has basically the main implication that the decision makers could change again back to a public sector kind of decision making from the PPP mindset that uh, you may have sold to in the previous city hospitals and basically this is driven by a fiscal constraints environment and the willingness to or the ability to predict those um, ROIs initially but we can definitely comment more one-on-one -on -one, um, in, in our briefings together. Great uh, another question we received. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see alcohol sales via e-commerce ever being legalized given the focus on e-commerce and digital? Um, that's a, I can see where this uh, is going in terms of looking for ways to maintain that sales growth in this kind of an environment. To be honest, we have not seen uh, much sign uh, of that from the authorities in terms of even evaluating this. Um, we know that some products have a, a gray area in terms of, for example, some products that do or don't fall into a pharmaceutical sector uh, categorization. There are some gray areas where companies have found, um, you know, that there's no regulation, so continue to be selling online. Actually, the government is looking for ways to close these loopholes rather than open up other uh, areas. 
for online sales, uh, we don't yet see a sign of that uh, happening. I think what we are observing from uh, our clients in the industry is more of a focus on trying to allocate their high-end customers and actually drive strategies that are a lot more specific to their higher income, uh, kind of high margin customers, whether it's through private events, whether it's through um, kind of content marketing online, um, and much more niche, and unfortunately sometimes costly <laughs> strategies, but there is much less reliance on waiting for that development, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, another question has just come in. Uh, do you foresee challenges um, sorry, foresee challenges in 2021 in securing hard currency? We think that especially compared to 2020, this is likely to be uh, less of a risk in 2021. This becomes a risk, of course, if um, we have severe challenges in uh, revenues for foreign exchange. Um, and that basically was more of a risk last year. And you would have seen from the uh, numbers that were announced by the central bank, where there was a severe loss of foreign exchange reserves, yes. But with the continuing commitment to uh, a liberal kind of um, market economics and a liberal exchange rate, this is likely to not be a major threat in 2021. Firstly, uh, FX reserves will, will start to recover. There will be more export revenue coming in this year, that is for sure. And we think that um, with less volatile purchasing, in, especially related to stockpiling this year, the demand on FX, again, could be much, um, again, less volatile this year than last year. So if there was a risk, it was much bigger last year than, than this year. But the challenge is, of course, not necessarily obtaining FX, but trying to uh, obtain it at the right moment. Let's put it that way in terms of uh, if your distributors and partners are uh, importing and trying to predict the timelines of their payments back to you, or in terms of uh, choosing the moment to transfer into dollars and repatriate profits, this is going to be probably the ongoing challenge of um, hitting the right time for obtaining that FX. Yeah, and I think that's a, actually, a good Point. Sorry, go ahead, Zainab. I was going to say we are also, of course, helping our clients on that front in terms of trying to have some sort of a calendar that at least gives us some ideas of um, when there can be additional uh, volatility pressures. March is an important month coming up, and we can follow up with our interested clients on that as well. Right. I was just going to kind of make that point as well. Uh, the currency volatility has been one of the, the biggest questions we've heard from clients uh, for the last year, of course, but this will continue for the next six months at a minimum. Uh, and this uh, and this is why, Zainab, as, you, as you've seen, we've seen greater demand for analyst briefings, uh, asking us currency uh, forecasts each month. Uh, so again, more reason to be continue to engage with us, try to ensure uh having quarterly calls with us we we forecast our our currencies of course every month so that's uh helpful to keep you up to date in such a such a volatile environment um so another question has come in uh saying up here so um uh on the political side of things so can you comment a bit more on how you see relations with the us and eu evolving following the change in the us administration so biden is the new president what does this mean for turkey mm -hmm. Of course. So clearly this was seen as an important turning point in terms of global kind of political dynamics, not just for Turkey. A lot of countries in the region have had to reshape, reevaluate their uh, approach to their key relationship uh, fault line with uh, the U.S. And Turkey is no uh, kind of no different in that regard. What uh, we expect is firstly, more alignment between the US and the EU clearly in, in foreign policy, at least relative to the Trump administration. And that, of course, creates some challenges for um, for Turkey right now. And we have also seen an important development in terms of the resolving of the blockade on Qatar, which has meant uh, some improvement starting to take place in relations between uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and, and Qatar as well. So um, numerous factors are in play, actually, not just uh, a new administration in the US. This, uh, first of all, clearly creates more risk. Uh, we, what we can observe from historic approaches that uh, Biden has, 
that he is more likely to have a more proactive engagement with uh, different groups in Syria, which of course is going to create uh, tensions with the Turkish government. He is also likely to have a more uh, strict expectation of um, behavior and alliances in terms of uh, Turkey as a NATO member. So clearly there are some signs of additional pressures that are going to be coming onto uh, Turkey. Um, but the level of um, pressure and how quickly that is going to be put, we're not extremely kind of uh, alarming of that. We want to see how the initial first few weeks of uh, the administration is going to um, approach the Iran deal, the Middle East politics, etc. It is possible that Biden may choose to gradually increase pressure, continuously uh, use negotiation um, as a way to get uh, what, what they're looking for, rather than kind of attack full front in, in the first month of his administration, basically. So risks ahead, but especially when we think about uh, the EU side, the willingness to really put severe pressure that really destroys the Turkish economy, that is really not in the interest of EU especially. So more alignment between the US and the EU could still mean a more moderate, gradual, but definitely increasing pressure on Turkey, which can create, of course, moments that we cannot predict today of tension and zero volatility. Okay. Um, another question has come in uh, related to politics still, more domestic politics though. Um, so, do you foresee early elections in 2021? Uh -huh. This is a this is a very recent uh, topic that is definitely, of course, coming up, uh, especially being brought up by opposition parties uh, in Turkey. There are some some allusions to this from some of the opposition parties, but from our broad analysis perspective, we do not count an early election as part of our base case. There's going to be uh, much more improvement needed on the economic side, firstly, uh, to for the government to want to enter early elections. We also believe that this year is still going to be a year of fighting a pandemic and trying to normalize uh, the, the economic and also social and healthcare environment. And in the midst of this chaos, it really does not make sense to, to host early uh, elections. And for those two reasons, we think that, of course, when you add the, the foreign dynamics in place, it really is not, from a logical standpoint, it does not make sense to hold early elections this year. We believe the government will not find it in its interest to, to pull forward elections. Uh, we could see that happening in 2022, potentially, before 2023. Um, but again, uh, it's, it's really about the government's calculation of how quickly will opposition ramp up. And 2021 is really not that um, going to be an easy year for uh, for Turkey or the world yet. And we think that that likelihood is still low for this year. Not sure if there are any other questions on the line, Mark, that, I'm sorry, that you're yeah. getting. I was, I actually mm -hmm. hit, muted myself, but uh, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so basically there, there were a couple questions left. We have one minute left, so I'll ask a final question here. Uh, the remaining questions, uh, Zainab will follow up with after the webinar, but um, the last question here, Zainab, is uh, how much of the local demand is driven by parallel flow to EU due to, uh, mm -hmm. to currency? Mm -hmm. This is a very important question that definitely creates a difficulty in predicting local demand for many companies, not only in terms of who their customers are so that they can actually target them in Turkey, but also how demand will flow. I know that this can create quite a bit of um, unpredictable flows in, in demand. Unfortunately, of course, this really depends on a product by product basis and it's very hard to give a, a ballpark kind of um, number on that but uh, especially on certain pharmaceutical products on many consumer goods there is, has been uh, effects depreciation um, related uh, needs for parallel imports into the eu the um let's say or let's say exports uh, to the eu and that um, is probably going to remain a challenge this year. The lira might not depreciate as much as, of course, 2020, but uh, especially when we think about 
the ongoing weakness of the of the lira still relative to especially the euro the, the forecast that we've seen uh, also from mark on the euro dollar side this is going to still remain a risk and if we look at um, the increased price sensitivity of even maybe the eastern european consumer for example after the pandemic as well um, this uh, there might be some unfortunately ongoing interest for this trend so we unfortunately we can't really say it's an easing trend this year if anything we would expect a similar uh, challenge and and at that point the only way to unfortunately manage this a little bit is increased communication with local partners that um, can collect a bit more of this information at the category level okay great thank you very much Zainab so uh, we're at the time limit here for today's webinar so any other questions that we didn't get to uh, Zainab will be sure to follow up of course and just a reminder everyone will be receiving a recording of this presentation as well as the presentation slides uh, within the next 24 hours uh, Please uh, be aware again that you can view, uh, view all these webinar materials and, and much more on the mobile app. Uh, and remember the complimentary free trial, 60 day access uh, to those of you who are, are not currently clients. Please email us for that uh, at info at frontierview.com. So thank you everyone uh, on the line for joining us today and we look forward to speaking with you again soon.